Deep in Tasmania's central plateau, these jagged ramparts carved by glaciers protect unique forests of native pine trees. These ancient ecosystems are special because they're found nowhere else on Earth. They're survivors from the Gondwanan supercontinent, from the age of dinosaurs when conifers dominated the land. It's not surprising that such iconic forests are listed as world heritage and dear to many hearts. These are parts of the planet that are just extraordinarily beautiful that many people through bushwalking, through tourism, through whatever, have become very close to. What do you love about the Alpine areas? Oh, just the expanse of, you know, you can see the sky, just such unique vegetation up there. This is one of the largest stands of pencil pine anywhere in the entire world. Each of these trees are amazingly old. This one here, for example, is well more than a thousand years. And they're incredibly slow growing. They've been hanging on since the last ice age. But that's the problem. Even the climate now is changing faster than they can keep up. The pines have retreated here because these refuges have ideal conditions for them. Always wet, often cold. But as the climate warms and dries, they face an ominous threat from the very soil that protects and nurtures them. Fire ecologist David Bowman is part of a research team that's made a new discovery. Pencil pines don't just grow as forests, they swarm in colonies from their roots. And each tree can be genetically identical. You can see this line of plants here. They're all clones. They're almost certainly they will be clones. And so you've got very old trees which are putting out roots, which are putting up new stems. They didn't all come up from seeds. They came up from the root systems of the Big Daddy. And we don't know yet how much that turnover has occurred, but we certainly do know that these things are clonal. And not only does that mean their genetic diversity is low, it suggests the age of the colony is much greater than previously thought. Some of these things may have originated from a seed right back the beginning of the current climate we're in, the end of the Ice Age, which is an astonishing thought that these organisms may be really quite old, not just a thousand years old, they may be thousands of years old. Because this species is highly sensitive to all but the lowest intensity fires, uncontrolled burning since European settlement has already reduced its geographic range by a third. 10% of Tasmania's pencil pines were killed in fires lit by people in 1960. Now all that's left is found on just over 18,000 hectares, mostly on the central plateau. These forests are supposed to be protected from fire by a thick, wet, spongy floor of peat and moss. But their saviour can also be their enemy. Tasmania has a lot of peat, especially beneath a million hectares of flammable buttongrass plains. Like a fuse, it extends into pencil pines and rainforests. These organic soils can burn if they dry out, sending fires underground. The peat that nourishes the forest becomes an explosive threat. It's a bit of a hidden menace when the relative humidity drops below 40%. That fire then erupts out of the ground and starts to burn freely again on the top. As the state fire manager for the Parks and Wildlife Service, Paul Black is responsible for protecting the World Heritage Area. For him, the peat that underlies it is both a valuable asset and recurring nightmare. In this time of drought, when a burst of dry lightning is detected, the Parks and Wildlife Service deploys spotter flights to check for fires. Lightning's not that unusual, is it? No. What we can see on this screen is an image of the lightning that came through last night. What concerns us in terms of being a land management agency is this patch throughout here in the middle of the World Heritage Area. And these ones out here, they're in large runs of buttongrass moorland. They're the sorts of storms that can give us trouble when we've got 
a soil dryness index map that looks like this, where you've got large areas of the state that are extremely dry. The Parks and Wildlife Service believes that lightning fires may not be entirely natural if human-induced climate change is a contributing factor. Levels of soil dryness like this over this part of the state, is that unprecedented? It is. If you look at the map, um, on the east coast there's quite high levels and they're higher than what's actually on the northwest, but in the northwest it's unusual. We're very used to having that on the dry east coast and we've got dry forest types, but up in the northwest those values are unprecedented. It's been the driest period on record for that area. This dire combination of drought and lightning is exactly what Jeff Law fears. He's been exploring and defending the World Heritage Area for more than 30 years and played a big part in its listing. Last year, on behalf of the Wilderness Society, he warned the UN's World Heritage Committee that the 2016 fire season would be particularly dangerous. We presented maps, diagrams and graphs that showed that lightning strikes were becoming the most prevalent form of ignition in Tasmania's wilderness, and that the area burnt as a result of lightning strike ignitions was now representing something like 99% of the area burnt within the World Heritage Area since the year 2000. Then on 13th of January 2016, a volley of dry lightning strikes lit up the tinder dry bush. Lightning hit the ground nearly 2,000 times. For Paul and his team, things suddenly got extremely busy. By around about 9 o'clock in the evening, we'd had something like 14 fires, but by the time I got to work the next day, that number was up to 28, and it just grew from there as more and more fires became detected over subsequent days. By the end of February, there ended up being 80 fires on reserved lands, burning more than 20,000 hectares of the World Heritage Area. Well, I felt sick when I first saw the locations of those fires because they were right on the doorstep of our most significant national parks. There was a fire right next to the epicentre of Tasmania's alpine country. There was a fire threatening some of our greatest stands of pencil pine. And the loss would be irreversible. So if the trees are all connected genetically, what does that mean if the colony is hit by a hot fire? Well, because seedling establishment isn't so common, you could wipe out a great big forest of pencil pines and it makes it incredibly difficult for it to recover if the root systems have been killed by burning peat. If that life insurance policy is burnt out, then very unlikely that these things would ever be able to recolonise. A few years ago, I was with Professor Bowman in the Australian Alps of Victoria, where lightning-lit fires have devastated alpine ash forests that only grow from seed. In this national park, tall, wet forests are now a sun-scorched wasteland. We're left wearing hard hats in the bush, looking for live trees in a dead forest. If it's a trend, then it's really amazing because we're talking about ecology in action. We're talking about climate and fire just overwriting landscape patterns. Is that trend now continuing with pencil pines in Tasmania? Nearly a month after this year's fires started, I've come to Lake Mackenzie with David to find out. Did you expect you'd ever see a time when these pine forests were burning? Uh, well, no, not really. I mean, it's a bit strange to be doing a research project on the occurrence of fires in these ecosystems then in the course of the research project. It all happens. It all happened. The larger trees in this grove were at least a thousand years old. They were killed just a few weeks before. What led to the death of this old tree by fire? Well, what I suspect happened is that there was a, a very dense shrub understory. You can see the dead sticks. And that fueled a very hot fire which burnt through. And then as the fire burnt through, killing these really old trees, it actually came up. And you can see it stopped 
on this fire yeah. break here. And that's where you've got the younger trees, which have formed a dense canopy, and it's got a moss layer. There's a sense of relief, though, that the fire was stopped by firefighters and heavy rainfall before it reached the denser forests of pencil pines. About 100 hectares were burnt, less than 1% of the total, but each tree is important. Looking at what's here, what kind of time do you think we're heading into now? Well, I would like to be proven wrong and that this event is actually one of these very rare events that have occurred in the past that we know about from lake sediments and from genetic studies which tell us that there have been fire events in these systems that have impacted them and they've been able to heroically recover. And the key thing is that the recovery requires, it's an imperative that the climate is cool and moist and that you don't get frequent fires. Well, we're on a warming, drying trend. We're going to have more summers, more lightning storms. All of the scientific evidence is telling us that. Then how are these systems going to survive? That's the conundrum. And so we have to start imagining a world where places that aren't going to get burnt very often start getting burnt quite frequently. Is this what climate change looks like? I believe this is the beginning of what climate change looks like. In the Australian Alps, we've absolutely seen the end of it. We've seen the elimination of a forest type and it required a reseeding program. Here, there's still hope, there's resilience in this system. But if I'm back here in three years' time, then we're absolutely looking at a state change. But conifers aren't the only forest at risk. Tasmania also has the largest tracts of cool temperate rainforest left in Australia, many areas not protected as world heritage. And with climate change predictions, it's likely that Tasmania will become drier and hotter, and so it's likely that we'll lose a lot of that rainforest. For her PhD, Jen Steiger analysed climate data and fire maps to predict at what point we can expect rainforests to burn in Tasmania, especially as they're often relied on as fire breaks. I found that the most significant predictor of fire spreading into rainforest was the amount of rainfall that had fallen in the 30 days prior to that fire starting. And I also found that that value was around 50 millimetres. In the month before the January lightning strikes, most of the weather stations in western Tasmania recorded rainfall less than 50 millimetres, endangering rainforests in the path of fire. So there's only six weather stations in the southwest of Tasmania that collect regular data, and another six on the west coast of Tasmania. So that's a large geographical area with not all that much data available. A larger network of automated weather stations in the World Heritage Area could provide early warning that rainforests are at risk. But putting infrastructure in national parks is controversial. Well, I think there's a case for introducing some of that technology to ensure that we do have rapid responses to these kind of dry lightning strikes in very, very vulnerable vegetation. And if some wilderness values are compromised as a result, then that's probably a price that we're just going to have to bear. Like rainforest, when fire erodes the green wet edge of the pencil pine grove, more flammable shrubs will invade. The risk is next time a fire comes, the remaining pencil pines will be surrounded by vegetation more likely to burn and incinerated. Under the current trend we're seeing, it's difficult to imagine populations like this surviving at the end of the century, because they're just eventually going to be picked off. And that raises really big questions about how we manage the World Heritage Area, what sorts of interventions we want. And questions have been raised about the preparedness of governments to protect World Heritage values from fire. This is the management plan for Tasmania's World Heritage Area. It's been in place since 1999. It says that wildfire suppression should be given top priority and requires rapid response capability. But just last year, 
This plan was rewritten by state and federal governments. It's still a draft, but terms like rapid response have been dropped. What are those things that you might expect to see in the World Heritage Area Management Plan are actually in some of our other more fire-specific plans. For the next fire season, Paul hopes for better climate data, enhanced predictive modelling, enough fuel reduction burning and more boots on the ground. We'd prefer to sort of see more training put into remote area firefighters so more of our firefighters are actually able to be used in remote areas. We need to revamp Tasmania's draft management plan for the World Heritage Area to ensure that the protection of ancient life forms such as this alpine vegetation, the pencil pines, the rainforests, the other conifers, to ensure that the protection of those is absolutely prioritised and that federal resources are brought to bear to ensure that it's not just the Tasmanian fire agencies carrying the can. It's difficult to deny that what we're seeing in Tasmania will happen again. While the loss of alpine ash is of forests adapted to fire, the loss of fire-sensitive ecosystems, like pencil pines and temperate rainforests, that aren't meant to burn, must be a wake-up call. We're seeing different patterns of lightning and associated rain. We're seeing much drier soil conditions than what have been recorded in the past, so one would just have to assume that that's a result of, of climate change. It's incredible to think how much the survival of these ancient forests now depends on the choices that we all make, because their risk from fire is no longer just natural. In a warming world, in a changing climate, we're all throwing matches. David likens the death of chunks of these forests to the first icebergs crumbling from an ice sheet as it starts to disintegrate. At what point do we say that the ice sheet broke up? At what point do we say climate change caused this? As far as I'm concerned, because I'm so immersed in seeing strange fire events around the world and studying them, when I saw this one, I just said, well, we may as well call it what it is, it's climate change. Because I can't keep special pleading when you have experiences like what's occurred in the Alps or already here in Tasmania, to keep saying, oh, it's exceptional, it's unusual, it's different. We may as well say, no, it's entirely predictable. It's what climate change does.